Tell us a bit about yourself. You're pastor of a, a wee bit of your history. Yeah, uh, I'm a stranger to this church, but I'm not really a stranger to Irish Baptist in general. Um, I'm 33. I was in Whitehead Baptist for eight and a half years. Um, prior to that, I was in Bloomfield Baptist for about two, um, from Portadown originally, brought up in, in Portadown Baptist. So, uh, currently pastor of the Way Church in Ballyclare. It's an independent uh, evangelical church. We planted it last year. So. The Lord's been faithful, good, and um, very encouraged what he's been doing over the last so year. So how do you, planting a church, how, how do you see people responding or what are your, how do you think the church is church life is today, Johnny? I'll just put my omniscient hat on the minute. How do you think church life is today? <laughs> um, people have, in terms of church planting, engaging the local community, uh, I still think the dominant problem in this country is probably not quite post-Christian culture yet. It's still confused between what is the gospel and what is just plain man-made religion. So there's still an awful a lot of confusion uh, that way. Uh, we, we stepped out in faith. We literally did not know. We believed the Lord was telling us to go and that a core group would gather from somewhere. We, so we started thinking, we knew about 10 to 15 were on board. And uh, the Lord had gathered, we believe, that I think that quite a bit of our evangelism is the de church Christians who are literally in the wilderness, going nowhere, disillusioned for one reason or another. And I, I do believe that there's a de church um, people that, that need evangelized as well. And quite, quite a high percentage of that has been, has been them. A few people as well have um, come and, and professed faith for the first time, who had been connected with church but just hadn't sunk in yet. So... Um, it's been rather encouraging, okay. yeah. Well, let me pray with you for today. Thank you. Father, we thank you for Johnny. Thank you for all that's happening with him in his life and church. But Lord, we pray that today you might meet with us and that he might be anointed by your spirit just to share your word and that you will touch some lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. God bless. It's been a joy worshiping with you and a pleasure to bring God's word. Um, please turn with me on that note to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. We're going to pick up the reading in verse 11 and read through to verse 23. Now, this particular passage had been running through my mind and heart for a couple of weeks. Obviously, I've had this booking a number of weeks and probably months in advance. And when Norman phoned me during the week to uh, just inform me of uh, the, the busy day that you have here, the events of bereavement and grief in the church, I, I had toyed with the idea of potentially changing the text, but to be honest, the more I pondered and thought about it, I think what we're about to read and some of the things we're going to consider this morning reinforces what has happened and what processes people associated with this church are going to be going through in terms of uh, grief and the hope that, that Jesus ultimately gives. So we're going to read from verse 11 through to verse 23 of Luke chapter 7. God's word reads, Soon afterward he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I said to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, said them, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases, and plagues, and evil spirits, and on many 
who were blind, he bestowed or shall we sight. Look for another? And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. This is God's word. In a congregation this size, there is going to be presently in your life one of two radically opposite Christian experiences at the minute. Some of you are here this morning and quite frankly, Jesus could hardly be doing anything more for you. It just seems that everything you do is being blessed. Prayers are being answered, provision is being made, blessing is just, it's almost smelt in the air. I mean, it just, it's just brilliant and you are on a spiritual high and it is going so, so well. And then there's maybe others of you here and that experience is just like a bygone memory. Jesus isn't simply inactive. It just seems that Jesus is absent altogether. And the prayers that are not being answered, the darkness that seems to continue, it's actually gone beyond discouragement. Discouragement's come and gone. You're rightly, outrightly disillusioned. Not just discouraged, disillusioned. And maybe even to the extent that the, the faith that you once professed the Jesus that you had so much confidence in, well, that's beginning to root away. And it's disillusionment. Now, what I find really interesting about the text that we've just read is that both those polar opposite experiences appear right beside one another in the text. In fact, the scenes are linked. In the first scene, Jesus is doing everything. The dead are being raised. The deaf are hearing, the lame are walking. I mean, Jesus is just present in active power and people are just sensing and seeing his wonderful power and grace and answers to prayer, if you like, and desires being met. There's the first scene. And in the second scene, we have a saint who is sitting around disillusioned. And the scenes are linked because what happens in verses 11 to 17 is reported back to John the Baptist, and it is only light of, in light of hearing this that John re expresses what's going on in his heart, and quite frankly, what's going on in his heart is, I'm really not too sure anymore. I, I want us to consider this morning, when Jesus refuses to buy, and we struggle to believe. And I want us to walk through these two scenes, we'll take them each in turn, See how they're linked. See how the Lord could be addressing us through this. And Lord willing, the, the Lord would be pleased to minister grace to whatever, whatever, con whatever scene you relate to most, that their Lord willing is a word in season for you. So let's consider, first of all, when Jesus refuses to buy. Got all the three points uh, there on the screen. Let's consider, first of all, that there's, it's a scene of great mourning. It's a scene of great mourning. Verse 11, Jesus and a great crowd are approaching a town called Nain. Now, there's not an absolute consensus, but there's a general consensus amongst commentators and scholars that, that this is a town called Nain today, slightly different spelling, but only a couple of hundred people, not a, not a massive town by any stretch of the imagination. By the way, that's so encouraging. Uh, there's been a, an awful lot of emphasis in the church over the last 15 to 20 years of the city, the city, and God loves the cities. We need to get to the cities, and us plebs in the outskirts sometimes feel forgotten. And isn't it lovely to see that Jesus goes to the town of even a couple of hundred? He goes to maybe those that are marginalized and least and lost. He's, he's going to the small places as well. Jesus is approaching the gate of the city. The reason why Luke wants to mention this is that at this time, towns, villages, cities had one entrance in, one entrance out. And there's actually two crowds in the text. There's Jesus and a crowd approaching the gate from the outside looking in. But they're going to be met by another crowd. And there's another crowd approaching the gate from the other side. They're getting out. And what is this crowd that's walking out? Well, it is a funeral procession. 
Um, at this time, burial sites were outside of the city, and so this is the scene that we have in front of us. The woman we know is a widow, so at some point in her life, she has already buried her husband. This is her only child, and she has lost her only child, which means she is going out to the place where she once buried her husband to bury now the only family member that she has had left. It is a sign, and it is a picture of great mourning. Um, there is a considerable crowd with her, because what this means is culturally, at this time, this is long before a welfare system, the, the state and government don't help out when needs like this are, are raised. Uh, this woman will be on her own. She will be dependent upon the mercy of her local community in order to help her out from here on in. As one commentator says, she is an orphaned parent. She is an orphaned parent. She may be of age to have children of her own, but she, now she is as vulnerable as a toddler on their own, unless someone from this community helps. And that's why they are with her. So picture the scene for a minute, right? As one commentator says, the way of life is going to meet the way of death. So who's right away at the gate? Who lets who pass? We, we get this in our culture, don't we? When, when there are funeral processions and you happen to maybe drive past a church and there's processions going out, what, what happens is you, you slow down if you're driving. You don't want to get in the middle of the mourners. You don't want to break up the procession. You, uh, even you see films from Victorian times, the horse and cart coming back with the hearse and the, the men stop and take off their top hat. There's a, there's a sign of respect to what's going on. So let's ask the question, what does Jesus do? Well, we, we now move on from great mourning to great compassion. Because Jesus now, we're told, as a, as a motivation for what he's about to do, has... And the word that, that is used, translated compassion, it refers to the moving of the bowels. Uh, it's not that Jesus is at a dodgy lunch. It is, um, in Hebraic thought, you say what you feel. We talk about butterflies in our tummy. The fight or flight response when the adrenaline gets going and you're going through stress. And we talk about tummy, and your tummy in a knot. Jesus is touched with the scene that he sees here. And out of compassion, Jesus does two scandalous things. One has a cultural scandal, one has a, social, a religious scandal. He speaks, he, sorry, he, he talks and he touches. First thing he does is he talks to the woman. Woman, don't weep. Now, you think about that for a minute. That's either coming from the words of a lunatic or coming from the words of someone who has so much confidence in himself that he can change this whole situation. Now, at this time, it was considered a rabbi's waste of time to talk to a woman in public. Even their own wife. You can save those jokes for later, okay? But the rabbi was going to say, it's a waste of time to talk to your wife in public if you're a rabbi. You've got much more important things to do. Do you remember in John 4 when Jesus is at the well with the woman and the, the big surprise for the disciples when they came back is they were surprised he was talking to a woman in public? So you just didn't do that. But Jesus has no problem breaking cultural forms of sexism. Amen? He's not afraid to do that. So he talks to the woman. But that's not the most scandalous thing that he does. He touches the casket, which would have made him ceremonially unclean, religiously unclean now. There's a rabbi doing this above all people. Why on earth would Jesus do this? And of course, not only does he talk to the casket and touch the casket, what happens next, of course, is this that young man comes back to life. So who, who gives the right away to who? What's Jesus doing in this passage? He's not bowing. Well, what's Jesus not bowing to? He's not bowing to death. And in fact, as the text shows us, death is the one that has to bow to Jesus. Now, this, is, of course, is before the death and resurrection of Jesus, but it is, of course, a massive picture and preview of what he is ultimately going to do. Like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, he stands as this procession approaches him, and he says, you shall not pass. And as the way of life encounters the way of death, the way of life swallows death up in victory. Now, let's pause for a minute, friends, because we need to consider something. There's a lot of things in the text that we do not relate to. We do not relate to towns and cities having one way in and one way out. 
Our infrastructure has improved greatly in this world with cities and towns and villages and the way they're made and roads and all of that access. We don't relate to a city with one way in, one way out. We, we don't relate to teachers not being encouraged to talk to women in the street. We, we don't relate to that. We don't relate to um, widows being effectively viewed as orphans because of their immediate family not being there. We, we don't relate to an awful lot of things in this passage. But there's one thing we do relate to. Death. That's still our present experience. Oh, our, our towns and villages have improved greatly. The social welfare system has made a big difference to the plight of society. Relationships between men and women in public have greatly improved. Not perfect, of course, still st sin still taints. And if our culture has anything, has witnessed anything over the last number of years through Hollywood and, and positions of power, there's still that abuse of relationship between men and women. But there's one thing our culture has not been able to remove, and that is this plight. And this was, in, this was what I was planning to preach on before this last week of Providence, right? So I know this is not just theory for the church here. But this is what we need to constantly remember. And, and you, let, here's the thing. You do realize you're allowed to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every Sunday, right? Not just the 21st of April, 2019. We can do it on the 28th of April. In fact, you can do this every, you can do it 365 days a year if you want. You're, you're allowed to do that. Because Luke in his wider context has let us know this. As Luke begins his gospel, he writes to this guy called Theophilus. And the purpose of Luke's gospel is this that you may have certainty about who Jesus Christ is. And the claim of Scripture is that Jesus Christ has done what no one else could ever do, namely conquer one of the greatest, the greatest plague, the greatest enemy, as Scripture would describe it as, as death itself. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is that not only is he strong, but he's also tender because he has addressed this woman in tenderness. And do you see the tenderness as well, what he does? He, in verse 15, hands this young man back to the woman. Now, there's a deliberate phrase that Luke uses here. How verse 15 reads is how the Greek text of 1 Kings 17, verse 23 reads, of what the prophet Elijah did. When the prophet Elijah raised a widow's son back to life and handed the son back to the mother. And this time, get the connection. Jesus' actions, he, mir he mirrors that of Elijah's. And what's the reaction of the people in verses 16 to 17? In light of what Jesus has done, a great prophet has risen amongst us. We go from great mourning to great compassion to a great prophet. The, the people claim that God has visited his people. Really important word. And the word for visit in Luke has already been used in the early songs of Luke's gospel to talk about God visiting his people in salvation through Messiah. Um, Jesus is going to lament how Jerusalem have missed out on their visitation in chapter 19. It's a word in the Old Testament. It's connected with God doing for his people what they could not do for themselves. Do you remember the story of Ruth and Naomi's gone to Moab and she's been there 10 years and she's lost her family and then we read she hears out in the fields of Moab, the plains of Moab, that God had visited his people. The context there is that he enabled her crop to flourish and famine was over. God has, so this, this town gets something special. No indication they think he's Messiah. No indication they think he's divine. But they absolutely know that God's blessing is upon this man. And the town are in absolute hysterics. Wow, this guy Jesus is great. He's doing amazing things. God has visited us. So surely as the news breaks out, surely there's going to be amens, hallelujahs, praise the Lord everywhere, right? Well, the text takes a really strange turn because not everyone is excited at this news. Not everyone's excited at this news. In fact, far from it. Because now we can move on to when we struggle to believe. We're now introduced to John. And let's consider, first of all, John's struggle in verses 18 to 20. 
Now, I don't know about you, but John seems like a bit of a diva here. You can sort of just picture him on his throne. Hey, you boys, come here. Got a message. You go to Jesus and ask him this question. And it's like, John, catch a grip of yourself, man. Go, go yourself. You're a bit of an ego trip. You think you're bossing people around. Here's your wee messengers. Hey, you go. But this is what we are not told in Luke, but we are told in Matthew. The reason why John cannot go to Jesus himself is because John is presently in prison. So John can't go to Jesus. That's why he has to send messengers. Well, why is John the Baptist in prison? Did he steal? Did he murder? Did he refuse to pay his taxes to the Roman government and they finally caught up with him? Why on earth is John the Baptist in prison? John the Baptist is in prison because he challenged the state about the sanctity of marriage and challenged sexual immorality. I know, really, really unrelated thoughts today, right? Wow. So, so John's in prison for righteousness sake. He's not in, he's not in prison because he broke the laws of the land. He's not in prison because he's done a bad thing. He's, done, he's in prison because he did exactly what the Lord called him to do. And in John's ministry, he described that the ax was at the root, that there was imminent judgment coming. But this is what John has since discovered. And maybe this is what you need to discover this morning if you're not a Christian. Jesus has been far from judgmental. Jesus has not condemned people in their lifestyle. Jesus has transformed people and brought people out of their lifestyle. So when in verse 18, when we read that John's messengers proclaimed these things to him, I don't think these things is simply a reference to verses 11 to 17. It's also a reference to verses 1 to 10 because these miracles happen very close beside one another. And what's Jesus doing in verses 1 to 10? Is he judging the, the Romans? Is he overthrowing the Romans? Is he bringing in Messiah's kingdom at the expense of the Romans? Oh no, he's showing grace, mercy, peace, love to the Romans. Now do you get the picture? John the Baptist is sitting in a Roman cell because he challenged the Romans on their, he challenged the state. And here's Jesus out and he's blessing them. So how would you feel? Anyone think that they've been given a raw deal? Jesus is out blessing the Romans and doing great things among the enemy, and I'm here trying to my very best for God, and look where I've ended up. Sour grapes, anyone? I, I, do you not relate? Can you not empathetic to John at the very, very least? Here's John. He's, he's obeyed the script. He's done what he's done. Um, in John chapter 10, the crowd saved John the Baptist. Everything he said about this man was true. He was totally and absolutely faithful in all that he had done. And a little like Jeremiah in the Old Testament. After Jeremiah had been persecuted once again, thrown, thrown into the cistern, Jeremiah cries to God, you have seduced me. This was not what I signed up for. This was not what, this was not part of the deal. So here's the question. Why is John struggling? He's struggling because of his prison experience. And what's his prison experience now a result of? And here I think is a really key insight, the disillusionment. I'll not ask for a show of hands, but if you're here as a disillusioned Christian, a high percentage of our disillusionment comes because of this. Because we have a preconceived idea of how Jesus is going to do something and when he blindsides us and does something, place our hope in the presumption of what God's will is going to be instead of ongoing hope in the even surprising providences that God will actually bring about in order that he will continue to work out his good and perfect purposes in our life. Now, if you're here this morning and there's no magic bullets, there's no formula, God's Spirit can totally bring you out of the pit of disillusionment in a moment, but let, let me encourage you at the very least in this. Will you at least take courage that the Bible validates and shows that this experience is legitimate? Now, he doesn't want you to stay there, but this is what I do. If you're here this morning as a disillusioned Christian, do not believe the lie that if you believe back then and at all that evidence, you'd be different. Have you ever noticed how often Jesus called his disciples to have faith, even though they had just witnessed a miracle with their eyes? You know what that shows us? A lack of faith is not because of a lack of evidence. It's to do with the disposition of a heart. 
So please don't be, don't be putting yourself under extra burden and pressure because this is what happens. You get disillusioned, you look intro, you're, you're introspective and it goes around, well, maybe I'm not a Christian, maybe I'm not even having saving faith, maybe, maybe, maybe. No, no don't, don't be going there. At least admit that quite often our disillusionment comes from a prison experience lens that we have been in. Let's move how Jesus responds now very briefly. Jesus signs in verses 21 to 23. Jesus' response to him is much more in actions as it is in words. In that very hour, we're told, he began to heal, deliver people from demonic affliction, and he sends the messengers back with this message for John. Now, a few things we need to reckon here. Here's the first thing, and this is just the way my mind works. How come when the Pharisees ask Jesus for a sign, he rebukes them? But when John asks, are you really the one? Jesus says, huh, you want to bet? And just, and he just, do, 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 do. What, what's going on there? And the issue is to do with the disposition of the heart. Luke's already shown us this, by the way, in his gospel. Luke chapter 1, an angel comes to Zechariah. Zechariah, your prayers have been answered and you and your wife are going to have a child. Well, how is that going to happen? Because we're both past age. Oh, well, since you doubted, you're mute. And Elizabeth said, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I wasn't in the text, but you get the picture. And then the angel comes to Mary and says, Mary, you're going to have a child. Well, how come that is? Because I've never known a man. Known a man. I have to worry about it, Mary. The Holy Spirit will sort that out. It's like, like Zachariah and Mary asked the exact same question to the exact same angel. Zachariah got mute. Mary got blessed. Did, did the angel Gabriel have a bad morning with Zachariah? Was he just a bit grumpy? No, it, it's, to do with the, it's to do with the reasons behind the questions. The Pharisees were never, ever submissive to the miracle ministry of Jesus. They just wanted to use him as a ploy for their own religious agenda. John the Baptist is desperate. And... No matter how this would particularly manifest itself, I want to tell you something. Jesus loves desperate people. Now, I know there's a whole theology about miracles and all of this, and I'm not going to be here and, and add any more controversy to the mix. Needless to say, I think there's two extremes we need to avoid. Says the pastor, he says, I'm not going to comment on it, and I'm going to comment on it. One comment is to say, gospel's bang, there's a massive disconnect between here and now, Right? I don't believe that's biblical, I don't believe that's helpful, I don't believe it's consistent. And the idea that it was just for then, and maybe, you know, if God kind of wants to, but we'll just say that because I know we have to. The other extreme, of course, is to say it's God's absolute will all of the time for you to see this, and if it's not happening, there's something wrong with you. Pastorally damaging, heretical, and uh, crazy, crazy. But Jesus does bless desperation. You know, you know the story of Gideon? And uh, we're, all, we're often quick to say he should never have asked for a fleece. The word of God was sufficient. He was wrong. And he probably was by asking for a fleece. It's not really common practice to use that as justification. But you know, what, you know what we often forget? God gave him the fleece. God condescended to his weakness. God knew he was weak. This is the amazing thing about the Christian gospel. God does not meet us where we should be. He meets us exactly where we're at. And Jesus now, as a picture of that, I am the one to come, shows these pictures of his grace and power and preview of his gospel work on the cross. But that's not all Jesus does. He does condescend to John, but he also holds out a challenge. And this is where we're going to land the plane now and see how they're interrelated. In verse 23, Jesus issues a challenge. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now that's given to John, and it's like a drop the mic moment. John, the ball's in your court. Blessed is the one. What on earth is Jesus getting at? Um, the, the word for offended means, it's that famous word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians to speak about the offense, the stumbling block. That's where we get our word scandal from, the scandal of the cross. So bless, blessed is the one who is not scandalized, if you like, with what I'm about. And so here's the question. How on earth could you be offended at Jesus? How could you be offended at the one who raises the dead, 
who heals the, the uh, makes the deaf hear and the blind see and raises those who are downcast. How could you how could you be offended at the one who preaches the good news to the poor? How could you be offended at Jesus? And here's the answer. You could be offended at Jesus, because we've already touched on this, if you hear about him doing it for everyone else while you're sitting all alone in prison for being faithful. That's how you could be offended. Jesus, that church up the road are getting conversions left, right, and center, and I can't remember the last time I had a baptism. Jesus, all their kids and teenagers are coming out to church and seem to be walking well with the Lord, but mine are wandering. Jesus, I've been trying my best, and I'm just not seeing any reciprocation here. Um, maybe, I don't know what the motives of John's heart was, and, and maybe, maybe John in his faithfulness felt he deserved something better, that he was entitled to something because of his work for God. And here's an interesting insight. The word for blessed also means happy. Because the day we think Jesus owes us something is the day that we begin to enter a joyless existence. Here's the thing. Jesus' love for John was no less than his love for the woman at Maine. But in this present circumstance, his love was working itself out and manifesting itself differently. You see, Jesus is sovereign not only over the power encounter, but he's sovereign over the prison experience. You know what I find, I, and I'll just be honest, this is what I struggle most about with the text, and I haven't got the answer to this. If you've got the answer, I would love to hear you at the door, and maybe you could preach on this next week and you know, finish off the sermon. What I struggle with the most, I just don't, Jesus is just so, you know, you'd almost think his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. Jesus waits, okay? Wait, this is the crazy thing about the text. Jesus waits until John the Baptist's messengers go. And then he turns around to the crowd and says, see that fella John? There's no one greater born of woman. And I'm like, why didn't you tell that to his messengers to send it back to him in prison? I mean, surely that would have encouraged them. But Jesus deliberately waited until his messengers go. And then he says, see that fella John? It's the fact that I love him. There is no one greater born of woman. And you might be thinking here, well, well that's John the Baptist. What about little old me? Well, I'll tell you, about little old you. Turn with me to verse 28 because this is what Jesus also wants to let you know. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. If you're a Christian this morning, you can say this with all humility. You don't have to understand it. You just have to believe it. You're greater than John the Baptist. And maybe you're going through a prison experience, not exactly like John the Baptist, because if you were exactly like John the Baptist, you'd be in prison and not here, but you're going through your own spiritual equivalent, disillusioned, you're, you're great in the kingdom. Jesus has not forgotten you. Jesus loved John equally as much as he loved this woman. And maybe, just maybe, the prison experience is but preparation for a deeper experience of that love. Have you lived long enough as a Christian to thank God for not answering certain of your prayers? If God answered every single prayer of yours in the exact same way that you always wanted it answered, you would probably be better off in so many different ways, but I can guarantee you this you would not love him as much and you would not be like him as much. Jesus loves us best, friends, when he loves us his way and not our way. When he loves us his way. And in handfuls of purposes, he will determine by his sovereign agenda for your ultimate joy and for the glory of his, his own name, he will ultimately determine when the power encounters come and when the prison experiences come. And he's bringing you to a good place. And here's, here's, here's the answer. Here's the, the big thing. How do we know he's loved us best? How has he loved us his way? Well, isn't it interesting that as the pages of the New Testament unfold, as we close, that our very salvation is spoken of in the exact same language as his miracles? We once were blind. 
Now we see. We once were deaf, but now we hear. Or the big dominant one in the New Testament letters is we once were dead, but now we've been made alive. Why? Because we deserved it? Because we were entitled to it? No, by the sheer grace of God. God has visited us in Jesus Christ in the most spectacular way, and he is going to visit again. And ultimately on that cross, he did become unclean. He touched the ultimate casket. He became the casket at that cross. He became unclean that we would become clean. And so concluding challenges as we wrap up. Will we trust him? Will you trust him not only in the power encounters but in the prison experience? Will you look to him and not to another? Who else can you look to? If you can show me, if you can show me someone better than Jesus, I'll sign up to it. But don't even bother looking because you're not going to find him. Where else can you turn? Because only he has the words of eternal life. Only he has absolute sufficiency. Will you trust him to love you in a way that he knows best? And will you take fresh confidence in the fact that he has supremely dealt with the greatest enemies that could ever, ever eternally harm us? Sin and death. He dealt with that at the cross. He rose triumphant. There is grace for you today, Christian. And if you're here this morning and not a Christian, there is grace for you as well. He comes to the least. He comes to the lost. He comes to those who feel that they're totally abandoned. He's there for the taking if you have Jesus this morning. I encourage and urge you to do so. Well, we're going to close, I suspect, and I saw my hand back over to Norman over the praise. And um, just as they're coming, let's just pause and uh, reflect. And as they leave us in this final song, uh, love to chat with you afterwards. And if you want to talk any more about how the Lord maybe has spoken to you, uh, I'll be, I would love to do so. Um, so God bless you. And may the, word, the Lord write his word upon our hearts.